Hello everyone. Hello Jord. Even Phil again, <laughs> side by side. That's <laughs> it. And hello Mark. Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight, Mark. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we're really looking forward to tonight because um, tonight Mark's going to be considering some thoughts on Psalm 42. And if we just share our usual uh, introductory slide, um, we'll see that the hour has moved, Phil. Uh, we're no longer in book one. Um, we finished book one with uh, Chris last time in Psalm 41. Um, and we're going to be thinking about Psalm 42, that is the opening to book two of the Psalter, where it perhaps focuses more on the nation uh, and perhaps less about David. And I think we're going to see some of these big themes um, tonight that we've considered before. We're going to see um, the steadfast love or the loving kindness of God once again. Um, so we can look out for that as Mark sharing some thoughts. And I think what's also interesting that Mark's going to share a few thoughts on um, is the titles that we've considered before. We've got a new title tonight, mm -hmm. Phil, that we've not, I think if we went back to the videos that Kevin did, he might have uh, touched on this briefly, but I think Mark's going to share some thoughts a little bit more because as we may have noticed, it's, it's not a Psalm of David. So before we um, hand over to Mark, Phil, would you mind reading Psalm 42 for us? Sure, I'll just get that up for everyone to be able to follow along. Right, let's read from Psalm 42. To the choir master, a muscle of the sons of Korah. As the deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night. While they say to me all the day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and such songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love. And at night, his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me. While they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? 
hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. So, wow. quite a dramatic uh, psalm this time, George. Yeah, definitely. I think it's interesting. It is in the psalm of David because we've seen these sort of tones before with David. But Mark, over to you to, to share some thoughts on Psalm 42. Well, thank you, Jordan and Philemon. Um, right at the beginning, Psalm 42 tells us it's a little bit different from the Psalms that have gone before. It's described as a muscle of the sons of Korah. It's thought that a muscle is a musical term, but we don't really sure just what it means. So we need to look at the sons of Korah. Um, Sorry, we don't seem to be following on. Uh, first mention. The sons of Korah are first mentioned in Numbers chapter 26 at the time when Korah, Dathan and Abiram rebelled and were uh, destroyed by God. And the sons of Korah, we're told, didn't die. Later on, we find that the sons of Korah are mentioned being involved in temple worship. First uh, Chronicles 6 verse 32 says that they ministered with song before the tabernacle of the tent of meeting until Solomon built the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. So it's not surprising that we find the sons of Korah involved in the Psalms. If we look through the book of Psalms, we'll find there are actually 12 Psalms in all attributed to the book to the sons of Korah. Uh, there's a, a block beginning with Psalm 42, uh, going on as far as Psalm uh, 49, eight of them there. And then Psalms 84, 85, 87 and 88 are all attributed to the sons of Korah for some reason not Psalm 86. Um, Psalm 42 is, is also uh, interesting because it's the first of the Psalms in what's described as uh, Book 2. And uh, obviously it's one of the ones that's not attributed to David. Um, we come back to Psalms of David later on as we work through Psalms. Um, some commentators think that Psalm 42 and Psalm 43 uh, should be regarded as one psalm. It's interesting because the same wording appears in Psalm 42 verse 5 and verse 11 and it also appears in Psalm 43 verse 5. If we took them as one psalm um, they would be uh, regarded as uh, uh, three sections each ending with the same refrain. And one structure would be uh, that the, the first five verses are a yearning for God, uh, and then the, the second uh, five are, are perplexity and distress. Psalm 43 uh, is a prayer for deliverance. There's not only that um, uh, refrain that comes in both of them, it's apparent uh, from the, the language that both Psalms have a similar meter. Well, it, Psalm 42 starts this beautiful way that the deer is panting for flowing streams and the psalmist soul pants in the same way for God. And it, it paints a picture for us uh, of uh, the, the deer who is perhaps being chased and is getting thirsty and looking for a flowing stream, knowing also, of course, that that will put off his enemies. And so he thirsts for the stream uh, and he thirsts for God and pleads to come before God. And that immediately suggests that we've got a, a little problem of understanding. Why? does he suddenly feel that he needs to uh, appear before God? Well, there are other scriptures that uh, reflect the sort, same sort of longing. It's not 
unique to Psalm 42. I've just picked out Joel chapter 1 and verse 20, who says, even the beasts of the field pant for you because the water brooks are dried up and fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. So uh, this is not a, a unique theme in scripture, uh, but we might need to wonder why it happens. Um, clearly then that the, the psalmist is feeling very remote from God. Uh, but you notice how he talks about God. Uh, as we go through the psalm, we find the phrase, the living God, thirsting for God, the house of God, hoping God, and my God, all in the first few verses. Why does he feel so cut off? And I think the, uh, the reason becomes rather obvious later when he starts to talk about my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. You see, the psalmist uh, sees God as being uh, focused particularly in Jerusalem and particularly in the temple or the tabernacle. And he's not there. He's uh, in the land of Jordan or he, he's in Hermon, uh, both distant from the, the city of Jerusalem. Uh, and he's away from those. Now, although God is everywhere and we cannot escape him, the psalmist feels because he's away from what is seen as God's particular house, he feels alone. I think there is a lesson for us there. We need to feel alone when we are away from those who share the same beliefs and faith that we have and we need to see that we need to be in the place where others meet to worship God and we'll see that a little bit more as we go through this psalm uh, and he talks about living water and this is a, a symbol that comes in in scripture quite frequently um, Jeremiah uses it on a couple of occasions at least. Uh, firstly, in chapter 2 and verse 13, where the Lord God says through Jeremiah, my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. They've hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Jeremiah sees the people of Israel as having forsaken the, the true God and provided for themselves. Uh, it's as if instead of having a, a, steam, a stream, sorry, of, of lovely flowing clear water um, coming straight off the mountains, they've settled for a, a, a cistern, a, a tank, uh, hewed out in, in the rock uh, with water that's perhaps a little stale, a little, um, a little polluted. But the, the irony is that the cisterns are broken and, and the water all leaks out, so they don't have anything to drink. And then later on in Jeremiah, uh, he refers in a prayer to, O oh Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth, for they've forsaken the Lord the fountain of living water. You see, the Lord God is seen as the source of life. And of course, uh, on a natural sense, that's true, isn't it? We all need a certain amount of water. Uh, and many of the, the drinks that we have will have a reasonably large water content. We need water. We can survive for quite a long time without food, but we can't survive for very long without water. So we need Lord water to live, and just as much, we need the Lord God, and, and we need to recognise that. Uh, even the Lord Jesus had things to say about this. In John chapter 4, he met with a woman uh, in Samaria. She was a Samaritan, not a, uh, a, a pure Jew by, by race, and she had come 
to the well in the heat of the day, which is something that wasn't normally done. Um, it, it appears that her way of life was probably not particularly uh, well approved of by the rest of the people. So um, she'd probably come to the well alone. And Jesus asked for a drink and she was a little bit evasive about it. And Jesus said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with. The well is deep. Where are you going to get that living water? The Lord Jesus was, was stuck. He was sitting by the well. Uh, he couldn't get anything out of the well because you had to bring your own container to uh, lower down into the well to get the water. That was why he asked the woman who presumably had done so. But Jesus was talking about the water the water of life. He said, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. Well, we know that, don't we? Particularly in a hot land, you, you long for a cold drink. Uh, you have a cold drink uh, and you feel uh, refreshed and absolutely able to, to go on. Uh, and a little while longer, you're thinking, I'd really love another uh, cold drink again, please. The Lord Jesus says, the water that I give will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And so what he's talking about is the, the teaching of eternal life, which we find through the Bible. Uh, and of course, that's uh, partly uh, what the psalmist is talking about, the message of the Lord God being the source of life. And therefore, uh, it, it, it's life that we need to, to focus on. Well, back to our psalm, the psalmist says, when, when shall I come and appear before God? Now, we might think, well, wouldn't he go every week? And, and I don't think that that's quite what he meant. Um, under the, the law of Moses, the men of Israel were supposed to appear before God at the place of worship three times each year. So each man uh, uh, you, you had to be uh, a, an adult so the Lord Jesus was first taken when he was 12 years of age um, would go three times every year the actual fact if we trace through the gospels we can find that the Lord Jesus often did that uh, so the psalmist continues in, in verse four these things I remember as I pour out my soul how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. So this, this, this psalmist remembers the times when he was able to go to Jerusalem uh, and to, to lead the rest of the congregation in, in glad shouts and shout songs of praise, he says. He was obviously very much involved in the worship of God. And, and I think what he's trying to say is that while our fellowship with God doesn't depend upon where we are or uh, the external circumstances, it, it might be affected by when we're unable to meet with those who share our faith. And so perhaps during this pandemic, we've, we've struggled and, and suffered um, I, I, and I picked out a, a little comment here from a book by uh, Dudley Fifield, The Praises of Israel. He, he talks about all of the Psalms and he says, uh, in relation to Psalm 42, we should never forsake the assembling of ourselves together for all these occasions have been provided as part of our spiritual experience to bring us nearer to God. Once the joy of these experiences has been appreciated, the yearning is created nothing should be able to keep us away. Now Dudley uh, fell asleep before uh, the, the pandemic uh, came on us um, uh, and perhaps wouldn't have appreciated that the, the problems that we've had uh, over the last few months and maybe it's been right.
we haven't been able to meet together because we obviously don't want to encourage the spread uh, of this deadly virus. But our hearts ought to yearn to be back at the place of worship. Our hearts ought to yearn to be meeting together physically to remember the Lord Jesus Christ, to break bread. We ought to be longing to be together with those who have the same faith as we do. It's, it's not always easy, and it probably isn't going to be easy in the future. But I think that one of the things that this psalm teaches very powerfully for today is our need to be together with those who share the same faith as we do. Uh, uh, things like Zoom and uh, uh, so on, uh, Skype have been wonderful when we haven't been able to get together, but it's, it's meeting together with those who share our beliefs that really is important. Interesting, Mark, because um, a few weeks ago we had uh, Johnny L. Duke and Phil on Psalm 33 talking about um, the new song and um, that experience that we have when we hear a great volume of people singing praise together. Yeah. And that experience. And when you when Phil was reading verse four and you were just talking about the experience that we've just had over the last year, uh, you know, I'm sure all of us have had moments where we remember you know, being with people uh, to, to be able to share, you know, fellowship, to talk about God, to sing praise together. And we can, I suppose, all really relate, as you've said, to this song and how we yearn um, or thirst. But then at the same time, perhaps we have to brain check ourselves to, to not, you know, be in a state where we where we perhaps not missing that. And, and we need to sort of make sure that we we still desire that that yearning to be together and to be with people who are going to encourage us in, in the right way. Absolutely. Um, uh, and uh, I would be the last to deride the, the blessings that we've had of being able to meet um, electronically uh, and so on. It's been absolutely wonderful. Um, and we ought perhaps to keep it going as, a, as an extra, but not as a substitute for meeting together uh, around the, uh, the worship of God. So um, the, the psalmist feels that he's been deprived of opportunities for fellowship with God. It, it, it wasn't that he couldn't, but it, this was such that it made him feel that he didn't want even to eat his ordinary meals. He said, my tears have been my food day and night while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? I think here's a man who is, is praying uh, that he can be back to worship God in the place that he sees as the focus. Uh, but he does the right thing. And again, there's a lesson here for us. He says, in, in verse five, why are you cast down on my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation. He knows that if he's faithful, ultimately, God will deliver him. He will again praise God. And that ought to be our confidence, oughtn't it? That we, we, we know that... Um, we can praise God, uh, we, we can praise him wherever we are, uh, but we need to praise him, particularly uh, in the place where we all meet together. So, so where is he? Verse six, we've looked at momentarily before. It says, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the, the land of Jordan. Uh, we should be able to see Jerusalem there roughly in the middle of the map. Uh, uh, the land of Jordan, the R Jordan River, runs all the way down uh, the, the centre of the land of Israel, and presumably he's there. May not be very far away from uh, Jerusalem, but it, it, it's a little bit of a way, and Jerusalem is, is much higher up 
that than Jerusalem that than uh, is the land of Jordan. So perhaps that would be a reason why he feels uh, that that um, he, he's remote from God. And then he talks about Hermon. Well, Hermon is right in the north. Uh, you might just be able to see that Mount Hermon uh, is one of the little uh, dots right at the top of the map. Um, Mount Mizar is not known, but uh, the other places are remote from Jerusalem. And so perhaps Mount Mizar was also distant from Jerusalem. Uh, uh, and then the, the countryside even adds to his turmoil. He says, deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. It's as if he's in a storm, perhaps on the lake. Uh, we know that at the time of the Lord Jesus, he describes storms on the lake. Uh, and here he is feeling uh, in danger of his life because he feels as if that he's being uh, covered with water. And yet, although he feels alone, he, he knows that that's not really true. And I think that is really helpful for me because there are times when we, we know that what we're feeling is unreasonable. We know that sometimes it's absolutely downright wrong, but it's, it's how we feel. Uh, and we can't help how we feel. We might have to do something about it, but that's it, isn't it? And so the psalmist says, by day, the Lord commands his steadfast love. And at night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. So, so God's there, even though we might feel remote from him, he's there. I say to God, my rock, and the, the Hebrew apparently for the, 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 the rock there is the sort of craggy rock that would give you protection. Um, you know, Moses was um, put in the cleft of a rock so that when the glory of God passed by, he should be cared for um there's a there's a hymn isn't there rock of ages cleft for me uh finding a a, a place to be secure and and uh, safe uh, when life is difficult so uh the psalmist says i say to god my rock why have you forgotten me why do i mourning because of the oppression of the enemy <coughs> he's he's worried about what's going on and it's interesting that he says by day the lord commands me and it's the the only time in the psalm that he actually uses the covenant memorial name of god the, the only time that he refers to him by his covenant name and he remembers now that god has made a covenant with his people and so the conclusion there is that god is always there a sort of craggy support even in the most difficult of times one that's there and god commands his steadfast love by day that that steadfast love is the hebrew word hesed which means mercy or loving kindness it's one of those lovely biblical words which reminds us of the qualities of God and, and his constantness in our, our life. Yes, Joel did, uh, whole, sorry. Sorry, Mark, yeah, Joel did a whole video on uh, steadfast love. For those of you watching and want to look at it more, we've got a, a dedicated video, didn't we, Joel? Yeah, we did. It's quite a while ago now, wasn't it, Phil? But it's, it's caught up quite a lot so it's good that we sort of uh, spend that time considering <coughs> like you said mark it's a really beautiful word that seems to appear lots throughout the psalms and throughout scripture as you know the rest of the bible as well so when he comes to verse 10 he says as with a deadly wound in my bones my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all the day long where is your god and to me, this is bang up to date. This is 2021. The talks of men like 
uh, not so much these days, Richard Dawkins, but it's not so long ago, that people who've got no concept of God and, and, and reject the, the very existence of God. Um, I picked one up in a second-hand bookshop a day or so ago and uh, looked at it and then put it away, uh, which said, if you believe in God, then this book is for you because it'll show you where you're wrong. Well, I've been doing that all my life and um, I'm, I'm quite sure I'm not wrong. But it's very easy, isn't it, to allow our faith to be undermined by those who would attack us. <coughs> Comfort comes because we, we've got a, others who've gone before who've suffered the same sort of thing. So adversaries taunt. They say, where is your God? Well, our God is in heaven. Our God is in his holy temple. Our God is very close to each and every one of us, wherever we are. We can't escape from him. And so he comes to a conclusion. <coughs> Verse 11. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall get again for i shall again praise him my salvation and my god it, it's a repetition of what he said in verse five it's going to come again at the end of psalm 43 whatever the circumstances we need to praise god and we need to hope in him and so whatever the circumstances of our life we we cannot be far from god we just have to get back to him and see that he's there to punt as a running deer does for the running water to be back in his house. And that ought to be our prayer uh, as we think about this psalm. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Mark. Uh, very helpful words and a uh, lot for us to consider. What stood out for you, Jordan, that uh, psalm? I think it was like you said, Mark, I thought it was really interesting that comment you made at the beginning about Psalm 42 and 43 possibly being one psalm. It reminded me of the session Richard did on the order of the psalms and how we can see the language and, and the themes that, you know, Psalm 43 almost needs Psalm 42 to, to answer some of the, the questions in there. And that phrase of, of your soul being cast down. And I thought what you said, Mark, um, about, you know, sometimes that's just how we feel. Um, was a really helpful point to me that you know we know we're not thinking the right things we know it's distant from uh, you know what, what it is to have a relationship with God but it's, it's so comforting to know that you know great men of faith felt like that as well and um, all we have to do is turn and rely on the steadfast love of God um, and, and pant for him and to, to be in his presence um, and to be with those who, who can encourage us to do that so I suppose our prayer is that as, as things move forward, we hope the restrictions continue to ease and uh, we can be together once more um, to, to praise our God um, and, and to be together to remember him. Great. So thanks, Mark. And thank you, uh, everyone who's watched this video. May you uh, found, find comfort from God in these challenging times or seek after him as a deer seeks for the water. Till next time, God bless all. God bless. Thank you. God bless.